Hi peeps, let's do some TOEFL listening today, especially more on note-taking. For all intents and purposes, note-taking serves two roles. One, to be focused on the lecture. TOEFL lectures are boring. Boring things can make you bored. When you're bored, your mind will wander away from the lecture. So at the end of the lecture, you don't catch that much content needed to answer the questions. To keep yourself focused on the lecture, you should write down some stuff from the lecture. 2. To refer back to the notes. Our brain RAM is pretty limited to store all the information from the lecture, so you need an external hard drive, which is your notes. You want to have the best external hard drive, don't you? Today I will show you how to take notes so that you can use them to answer the questions. When jotting down, you should divide the lecture into 5 to 6 paragraphs. The reason is that one question is based on one paragraph, and the questions are usually in the order of paragraphs. That is, the first question comes from the first paragraph, and the second question comes from the second paragraph, and so on. So if you divide the lecture into paragraphs, then you can review only the relevant paragraph, instead of searching all over your notes to answer the question. Doesn't that save your time? When the professor is talking about a topic that is quite different from the previous one, you should separate the two. To signal that a chunk of ideas comes from the same paragraph, use P1, P2, P3, and so on as the head. By writing down the main points using a paragraph number, you can easily refer back to your notes if you don't remember some details that occur in the option choices. Under each heading, aim to write down at least three details. This is what your note should look like. Let's use this lecture as an example. Take a listen. Okay, let's get started. Great. Today I want to talk about a way in which we are able to determine how old a piece of land or some other geologic feature is. Dating techniques. I'm going to talk about a particular dating technique. Why? Good dating is key to good analysis. In other words, if you want to know how a land formation was formed, the first thing you probably want to know is how old it is. It's fundamental. Uh, take the Grand Canyon, for instance. Okay, this is a good place to divide the ideas. Since now he's talking about Grand Canyon. The main point so far is that the lecture is about the dating technique. That is the technique to determine the age of geological elements. An important detail is that a good dating technique is indispensable to study the formation of geological structures since we first need to know its age. Moving on to the second paragraph, let's take a listen. Now, we geologists thought we had a pretty good idea of how the Grand Canyon in the southwestern United States was formed. We knew that it was formed from sandstone that solidified somewhere between 150 and 300 million years ago. Before it solidified, it was just regular sand. Essentially, it was part of a vast desert. And uh, until just recently, most of us thought the sand had come from an ancient mountain range fairly close by that flattened out over time. That's been the conventional wisdom among geologists for quite some time. But now we've learned something different and quite surprising using a technique called... Okay, this is a good place to divide the ideas, since now he's talking about a new theory. Paragraph 2 is about a conventional theory that explains where the sand that constitutes Grand Canyon came from. Conventional means commonsensical, that is, not that original. What is the commonsensical idea here? That the sand must have come from somewhere nearby. Conventional often has a negative connotation. Check out this video to understand what connotation means. From the term conventional, we can expect that the theory is going to be rebutted. Moving on to the third paragraph. Take a listen. But now we've learned something different and quite surprising using a technique called uranium-lead dating. 
I should say that uranium-led dating has been around for quite a while, but there have been some recent refinements. I'll get into this in a minute. Anyway, uranium-led dating has produced some surprises. Two geologists discovered that about half of the sand from the Grand Canyon was actually once part of the Appalachian Mountains. That's really eye-opening news, since the Appalachian Mountain Range is, of course, thousands of kilometers to the east of the Grand Canyon. Sounds pretty unbelievable, right? Of course, the obvious question is, how did that sand end up so far west? The theory is that huge rivers and wind carried the sand west, where it mixed in with the sand that was already there. Well, this was a pretty revolutionary finding, uh, and it was basically because of uranium-lead dating. Okay, this is a good place to divide the ideas, since now he's talking about the dating methods. P3 is about the new theory that explains where the sand that constitutes Grand Canyon came from, that it came from a faraway place, the Appalachian Mountains. Moving on to the fourth paragraph. Why? Well, as everyone in this class should know, we usually look at the grain type within sandstone, meaning the actual particles in the sandstone, to determine where it came from. You can do other things too, like look at the wind or water that brought the grains to their location and figure out which way it was flowing. But that's only useful up to a point, and that's not what these two geologists did. Uranium lead dating allowed them to go about it in an entirely different way. What they did was, they looked at the grains of zircon in the sandstone. Zircon is a material that contains radioactive uranium, which makes it very useful for dating purposes. Uh, zircon starts off as molten magma, the hot lava from volcanoes. This magma then crystallizes. And when zircon crystallizes, the uranium inside it begins to change into lead. So if you measure the amount of lead in a zircon grain, you can figure out when the grain was formed. After that, you can determine the age of zircon from different mountain ranges. Once you do that, you can compare the age of the zircon in the sandstone in your sample to the age of the zircon in the mountains. If the age of the zircon matches the age of one of your mountain ranges, then it means the sandstone actually used to be part of that particular mountain range. Is everybody with me on that? Good. Okay, this is a good place to divide the ideas. Paragraph 4 is about the nitty-gritty procedures of the uranium lead dating method. The uranium lead dating method measures the quantity of the lead in zircon, which helps us determine the age of the zircon. To find out where the Grand Canyon sand came from, you measure the quantity of the lead in the zircon obtained from the samples of Grand Canyon sandstone. You then measure the quantities of the lead in the zircon obtained from the samples of nearby mountains and Palachian mountains to determine their age. According to the experiment, half of the sampled zircon of Grand Canyon has the same amount of lead which is equivalent to say as old as those of the Appalachian Mountains. So concluded is that half of the sand came from the Appalachian Mountains. Moving on to the fifth paragraph. So in this see. case, uranium lead dating was used to establish that half of the sandstone in the samples was formed at the same time the granite and the Appalachian Mountains was formed. So because of this, this new way of doing uranium lead dating, we've been able to determine that one of our major assumptions about the Grand Canyon was wrong. Like I said before, uranium-led dating has been with us for a while, but uh, until recently, in order to do it, you really had to study many individual grains, and it took a long time before you got results. It just wasn't very efficient, and it wasn't very accurate. But technical advances have cut down on the number of grains you have to study, so you get your results faster. So I'll predict that a uh, uranium-lead dating is going to become an increasingly popular dating method. Okay, this is a good place to divide the ideas. Paragraph 5 is about why the uranium-lead dating method was not popular in the past, 
but is gaining popularity recently. It used to be inefficient and inaccurate, but now it is efficient. Moving on to the sixth paragraph, take a listen. There are a few pretty exciting possibilities for uranium-led dating. Here's one that comes to mind. You know, the theory that Earth's continents were once joined together and only split apart relatively recently? Well, with uranium-led dating, we could prove that more conclusively. If they show evidence of once having been joined, that could really tell us a lot about the early history of the planet's geology. Phew, the lecture finally ended. Paragraph 6 is about using the uranium-led dating method to test the Pangea theory. Now, let's look at the questions. Question 1. The answer can be found in the first paragraph. He said that the lecture is about a dating technique that helps geologists determine the age of geological stuff. So the answer has to be B. Question 2. The answer can be found in the second paragraph, where he talks about the conventional wisdom. So the answer has to be D. Question 3. The answer can be found in the fourth paragraph. So let's refer back to the fourth paragraph notes. Uranium changes to lead, so by measuring the amount of lead in the sandstone, we can determine the age of the zircon. So now we know the age of the Grand Canyon sandstone, and then we compare that age with the age of mountain range by measuring the age of the zircon of these mountain ranges. If the zircon in the Grand Canyon sandstone matches with the zircon in a particular mountain range, then the Grand Canyon sand must have come from the particular mountain range. So the correct answer should be B, C, A. Question 4. The answer can be found in the fifth paragraph. It was all about the efficiency of the method, so answer should be B. Question 5. The answer can be found in the sixth paragraph. Breaking apart of Earth's continent is the Pangea theory. So answer should be A. Question 6. This is an attitudinal question. Well, as everyone in this class should know, should implies obligation. Why it's an obligatory for students to know? It's because the professor already covered the material. Right? So, answer should be B.